incredible, it is huge! There's all kinds of debris flying through the air, all kinds of debris. It's yeah. becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. There's two tornadoes, the other one's growing. Don't mess with this thing, don't go outside and look at it because it'll kill you. God is the only one who can protect people right now. On May the 3rd, 1999, a violent storm system with at least 85 tornadoes rakes Oklahoma and Kansas in the Midwest of the USA. Here in Tornado Alley, there are more twisters than anywhere else on Earth. And one tornado will carve out a path 38 miles long and a mile wide through the suburbs of Oklahoma City. It will obliterate whole streets. 45 people will die. This is the story of what happened that day. But for one group of people, the story starts some days earlier. On a wet morning at the height of the tornado season, a group of storm chasers sets out from Oklahoma City. Their aim? To track the elusive twister. The tour is led by Todd Thorne, who's been chasing tornadoes for seven years. With him are three keen amateurs. Don Owen is from South Carolina. Simon Aubrey is a glider pilot and a severe weather enthusiast from Britain. As is Dan McKenzie, who's been fascinated by storms all his life. I'm feeling pretty excited. Um, so it's only just begun now, so uh, it's hard to describe what's going to happen. And, um, we have plenty of rain here. We're moving south towards uh, the southeast side, southwest side of Oklahoma. Uh, this is one of the best starts we could have actually even hoped for, I think. Their tour will shortly take them through the path of one of the largest tornadoes ever recorded. Storm chasers often set out from Oklahoma City. It's in the middle of America, in the Great Plains, halfway between the east and west coasts. And this part of the Midwest is known as Tornado Alley because of the special set of weather conditions that occur when warm air from the Caribbean moving northwards is pushed up by cold air coming down from the north. The clouds that form can stretch up to 40,000 feet or more. Up there, something else is going on, the jet stream. This fast-moving air blows the top of the storm into an anvil shape, and if the winds are right, the whole storm starts to rotate. This type of storm is called a supercell, and it's at the bottom of these that the really big tornadoes form. The largest are known as F5s. They can lift whole houses off the ground and fling trucks hundreds of meters through the air. Further down the scale, an F3 can overturn trains and tear roofs off houses. The smallest are called F0s. They can rattle chimneys and roof tiles, but they don't cause serious structural damage. Todd's group would welcome the sight of any tornado, no matter what the size. Storm chasers routinely cover hundreds of miles in a day in search of the ultimate thrill seeing a tornado for themselves. Hopefully, we'll be able to catch the storm while it's uh, still sort of moving uh, northwards. Uh, but it's a bit touch and go at the moment, so, you know, I think that's probably the best, best, the best idea, and I'm sure Todd uh, knows what he's doing. So. We've got some severe storm cells brewing up in the Texas Panhandle, which are making their way, hopefully, north, northeastwards. So with any luck, we should meet them. But after several days and many hundreds of miles of chasing storms, they've seen a lot of rain, a few hailstones, but not a single tornado. We keep getting reports that a tornado is on the ground and there's a, another severe storm that's uh, developed way back where we've just come from, actually. The tension is beginning to show. Oh, dear. We've been chasing our own asses around the Arkansas and Oklahoma countryside. That's it. I, I don't. I don't think we're gonna get to see one today. 
never mind. But today is May the 3rd, 1999, and something is about to happen which will change many people's lives. Todd's group is in Texas when they hear something on the radio. The National Weather Service has issued a tornado warning for Gravely County in central Oklahoma. Something is brewing back in Oklahoma City, so they set off in hot pursuit. Tornado warnings um, being issued in Oklahoma City. And right now we're about, what, 150 miles? Well, not that, about 50 miles away. I mean, they've actually had two reported tornadoes on the ground. Uh, but that storm is probably pretty, you know, too much, too far ahead. But the one we're looking at now is sort of just coming to the border of the Oklahoma. So if we're, we're going to see now if it's going to pick up, but there's nothing, there's no lightning activity at the moment. But on the radar about an hour ago, it looked pretty good. So we're probably going to have to stick with that, if anything. On their way, they learn that a major tornado has just touched down near Oklahoma City. It's the beginning of an event that will be reported all around the world. They have mixed feelings about seeing the effects of a large tornado. Yeah, I don't want to see it on her, but, you know, it's a cause of nature and people, you know, if they do as they're told, they'll get, you know, get into a basement or somewhere safe. But, you know, some people are also going to lose their lives on a shoe. It's likely that it will affect affect us in some way. It'll certainly affect me, I think. I don't like to see anybody's life being turned upside down. And, you know, the, the devastation and, and uh, destruction and death that, that these um, storms can do, it's, uh, it's not very nice. Back in Oklahoma City, weather helicopters are scrambled from local TV stations. They know something big is about to happen. And just before five o'clock, it does. Over my shoulder, a large and violent tornado right now. More than likely an F3, F4 tornado winds, probably in excess, are up around 200 miles per hour right now. It's done damage just to my west and to my north. And as you see over my shoulder now, a very, very large tornado on the ground doing damage just to the south and west of Chickasha. Car 21 in Chickasha confirms that tornado due west of Chickasha. Now Local TV stations start putting out urgent tornado warnings. Take your immediate tornado precautions. Val, what do you have? It looks like, uh, best I can tell, it's probably on the north side of town. Yeah. Tracker yeah. Val Castor is one of many storm spotters sending in live reports. With this tornado, you need to be below ground level. We're out there in the business to keep people safe. Uh, our number two objective is to get good video. Shoot video, big, big time, just roll the video. Gary, it's a half a mile or less right in front of us. It's leveled a couple houses over here. That was one of the most tense I've ever been. Uh, the atmosphere in the truck, of course, Amy's sitting over here. She's got her hands full. She's shooting video. She's sending back pics on the computer just as fast as she can go. And I'm talking on the phone, giving live reports back to a half a million people on the telephone. Oh, man, we've got debris Gary. everywhere. Oh, man. Everything is leveled out here. The storm now heads northeast into the town of Bridge Creek, then on into the suburbs of Oklahoma City itself. Gary England is chief weatherman for Channel 9 TV in Oklahoma. Val, what do you have? Oh, it's large, Gary. It's very large. It is uh, definitely a wedge. Oh, my God. Oh, all right, I assure you, this thing is a monster. You folks, the path is you should take your immediate tornado precautions. With this tornado, you need to be below ground level. By half past five, the tornado is traveling alongside the main freeway, heading for Oklahoma City. See, I see somebody driving down Interstate 44 to the north. Yeah, there is. I if, you're driving, uh, but if you're driving anywhere between Chickasha and Oklahoma City on I-44, get off of that sucker now if you got to run through a finch. Uh, Gary, are you there? Say again, Val. Man, this thing is still just as large as it ever was. That's exactly what it is. The whole thing's on the ground. By six o'clock, Gary knows the tornado is a killer. A large piece of the breeze flying through the air about 200 yards to our north. I tell you folks, I'd get the cellar right now if you haven't already done it. Don't mess with this thing. Don't go outside and look at it because it'll kill you. Oh, whoa. Oh, power flashes. Oh, flashes. man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Now, you folks, as you folks watch this, this thing now, as you watch this, keep in mind, whoa. Oh, hey, many Christmas. Uh, many structures will not survive this tornado. You need to be below ground with this storm. This is a deadly tornado. Huge. But while local TV stations are warning everybody to get away and take cover, one group of people is racing towards the biggest tornado, desperate to get as close as possible. They're scientists, 
and the leader of the group is Josh Werman. Um, so we should be getting very, very good dual bar fire on this right now. After two hours driving, they're starting to close in on their target. Tornado! The motion's pretty much to the northeast, so you might want to get northeast of it where you have a good view. Okay. We were scanning with the radar while we were moving and looking at what clearly had become a major, major tornado. It looks pretty strong, 70, 80 meters per second. It's got a little noisy things in it, which make it hard to tell. The scientist driving the Doppler radar truck is Herb Stein. It was definitely a monster. It was a very large tornado, spatially, and it was also very strong uh, on the radar. Yeah, your radar indicates F3 at least. Our radar? Yeah, our radar indicates F3 at least. At that time, we had very mixed feelings. We were very interested in the data we were collecting. Um, but it was clear that if the tornado didn't die, that it was capable of causing just a, a major catastrophe. 2.2 2 kilometers. Oh, boy. 2.2 2 kilometers. Yeah, boy, that thing's still rotating big time. Keep getting closer. We got incoming debris. Incoming debris flying all over. I looked out and I saw some debris clouds of parts of homes and people's lives, you know, flying around in the sky. It's a corrugated metal, usual debris. Then when we were driving along and there was just, just miles and miles of small pieces of debris in the road and I was really concerned for the people it was hitting. We'll go till our tires won't take any more. There's a car here flipped over or oh, something. Yeah, people, they have a car left. Clock, clock, Look at the tornado. Man, that was visual. Man, that looks nice. I guess that's crossing the road now. Tracking the tornado for an hour and a half, they can calculate where it's heading next. Our forecast was that the storm would actually cross Interstate 44 and move towards Norman, which was my hometown. Um, I have a pregnant wife and small baby at home, and so I had a lot of just personal concern about what was happening there. So it was an anxious time for us because we didn't know if the tornado was actually going to go straight for our own homes. Josh Werman's family is lucky. The tornado misses Norman, passing just to its north. Up to a mile wide and north section of Moore and Midwest City were nailed. The storm chasers are desperately trying to catch up with the tornado, but they're still some way off. Now, a little bit east, like miles. maybe a half mile. Okay. There's been some major damage. Okay. I don't okay, think so we'll we're talking it. about over here to the east of The radio South reports major. make sobering listening. Oh, we're looking at the damage. This is uh, it, it, very it, incredible. Mike and Dan, this, yes, go ahead. This, this is just, <laughs> you know, you guys can probably describe it better than I can. I don't know. But, I mean, it's, this is heartbreaking. I mean, cars are twisted like toys, but, I mean, at least one forming thing was people were running out hugging one another, you know, relatives, loved ones. I, I hope, Dan and Mike, that we don't have any deaths, but looking at this devastation, I, I just can't believe there's not going to be some fatalities in this. Everybody's out in the street now. I mean, this is, this is an incredible sight, uh, Mike, from up here. I mean, it's kind of hard to talk because, I mean, there's so much destruction up here. And I, these people are just, there's nothing left of their homes, Mike. I mean, it's just devastation beyond belief. Well, this was not an F1 tornado, it wasn't an F3 tornado, it was an F4 or an F5, and these are capable of totally sweeping away brick homes, uh, well-established okay, homes sweeping them completely four, away five. and destroying them. That's what we're looking at right now. One storm chaser who is in the right place at the right time is Mark Weinberg, chasing the twister with his driver, Ryan Willis. I knew that it was a beast. I mean, I knew that it was, it was looking really dangerous. And uh, we started to get closer and closer. And as we started to get closer, we really started to realize that this was a dangerous storm. Two tornadoes directly next to each other. Unbelievable! And then it was just boom, tornado after tornado after tornado. And we saw nine tornadoes that day. And, and one was the big one, I mean, unfortunately. Slow down, Ryan. Slow down, Ryan. Tornado on the ground. Tornado on the ground. Multiple vortex tornado again. Tornado on the ground. If I don't go where he says, or if I go too fast or do something like that and, and we have a wreck or an accident or something or get in the wrong position, then, I mean, it could be a life or death situation. Large fat wedge! See power lines, right? Oh! I told you to be careful.
careful, Ryan. I couldn't see him, dude. I told you to be careful. I couldn't see him. I need to constantly be be pushing Ryan to, to do what I need him to do as quickly as possible. Stop in here, stop here, stop here, stop at the light, at the light, at the light. Stop, stop, stop! Don't go past the light, listen to me. Stop here, let me video, stop. Tornado directly in front of us, about to cross the road, watch for power flashes, one, two, wipe for once. By seven, the storm is reaching the height of its powers. With wind speeds of 318 miles an hour, it's the most powerful tornado ever recorded. It now carves a deadly path through the suburbs of Moore and Dell City. It's 10 past eight before the tornado finally blows itself out. Then comes the shocking aftermath. The search is on for missing friends and relatives. There's all kinds of, there's gas leaking everywhere. There's gas leaking everywhere, you do need to be careful. Frantic to find their son, this couple raced through their neighborhood while others just stood and stared at homes that no longer existed. The house is gone except for one closet. It's, it's, it's all gone. It's, it's all gone. It's all gone. It's all gone. It's all gone. Here, we need a little more help. We need some more help here. Amidst the carnage, there are some incredible rescue stories. Deputy Sheriff Robert Jolly is on duty in Bridge Creek when he makes a remarkable discovery. What I'd found up under some debris around the base of a tree was what appeared to be a baby. Uh, the baby kind of whimpered, so I reached under and pulled the baby out. When I pulled the baby out, uh, her little eyes, her little ears were packed with mud. When I started brushing it away, the baby cried. Amazingly, baby Ilya and her mother survived the storm unscathed. But as the storm chasers approach Oklahoma City, they realize there have been dozens of fatalities. Much of the city is now cordoned off with police roadblocks in force. Eventually, they realize they are stuck in the traffic jams. So, a little bit of debris coming in here. We tried to stay this side because all the traffic was over on the other side. The traffic was just stopped, according to the radio stations. We went really fast just to catch up with it. Now we're in the middle of it. We're stuck here in Oklahoma City. There's no, 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 no way of tracking around all the traffic to get to, to, get to anything. So, yeah, so, so I, th I, think, I think we're, uh, we're, we're getting a room while rooms are still available. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming, quite overwhelming. The next day, the full extent of the devastation becomes clear. We've had tornadoes all our lives, and this is tornado country. We're used to it, but they always go somewhere else. You don't think about them hitting you. This wasn't your average tornado. This is one of the ones that they say is rare, never happens, whatever, and have it to go right over my house. They say it's the strongest one that's ever hit. Cars strung everywhere, nothing but trash. You didn't have time to be afraid. You didn't have time to get scared. All you had time to do was pray. One of the survivors of the storm was Jim Huff, who took shelter in his house that day. As the tornado ripped the house apart, his son Greg was thrown 45 feet out into the yard. Miraculously, his whole family survived. This is our dining area, our patio, or our den was right out here. And I was at the door, just over this side of it, looking out the door at the tornado as it came across the field in front of us. My son was upstairs watching. And together we came into the dining room and went into the bathroom. And my wife and I were laying on the floor there as the tornado went over and blew us away. For a moment, Jim says, 
He was caught in the vortex. When I was looking up into the eye of the tornado, it was like looking through a straw. You could see the walls of the tornado, and you can see anything that you could imagine going around on the inside of this thing, but there was nothing. It was just a hollow tube all the way to the top to the, come to the bottom of the cloud where it came out of. And it, was, it looked to me like it was straight up at least three or 400 feet. And you could see anything that you could imagine, automobiles, trucks, pieces of houses, pieces of cars, pieces of machinery, uh, some things you couldn't even describe. And it looked like boulders and blocks of cement, just anything you can imagine. And it was just so quiet and peaceful in the center of it. As it the, the two or three seconds that I could see this, it looked like a straw just going straight up and this stuff is flying around on the outside of that straw. Thelma Prugert from Moore, Oklahoma, took shelter with her family in a specially built storm cellar. We kept hearing this bang, bang real loud, you know. It was too big, too much noise for hail. So when it quit, my son opened the door up a little bit and he said, Mama, your house is gone. And I said, oh, quit to teasing me. Because I had just told all these kids they were crying. I said, no, I've been here all these years and nothing's happened like that. It will be all right. And he opened the door all the way up, and he said, the whole town's gone. <laughs> well, I couldn't believe it. I have been here all my life, and I have never seen nothing like this. Never. Many people came home just after the tornado had passed through. For Rod Phipps, it was a bleak and unrecognizable landscape. My stomach just dropped when I saw when I saw this, and I realized that yes, that's where my house was, and I would just. And when I but when I found out everybody was okay, it was it didn't matter. So. I never seen been able to look out and see five miles that way. I've never been able to look out and see that hill that horizon over there. And now, and I look at it, and I I can't believe. I can't imagine a, a wind strong enough hitting a house and it literally explodes. It had to explode because I find the big items, the freezers, the washer and dryer, the big items are th that are heavy are gone. This is just the little things is what I, f I find that just fell down in some little crack somewhere. But the big stuff, cars that I've never seen before is here, you know. I, I can't, I can't personally cannot picture that kind of wind. This blue truck I've never seen before. I don't know who, who belongs to that. The red pickup out here where the young lady's walking was my next door neighbor's. <laughs> he just bought that maybe a month ago. Brand new truck. This used to be so beautiful back here. Nothing but trees and greenery. And then I found, I think every jar, I think I had 15 quarts of, uh, I made some bread and butter pickles and I had some jalapeno peppers and they were all in this area, unbroken. There's another one, there's some jalapenos. Best jalapenos you ever had <laughs> come out of my backyard garden. So uh, it just surprised me. I just find little stuff like that and, and uh, take it on back, see if I can make me another home somewhere. Most of the homes here cannot be salvaged. They will now be bulldozed and the debris removed. The damage in Oklahoma City alone is estimated at nearly $1 billion. And because of the sheer volume of work required both here and elsewhere in Oklahoma and Kansas, it may take up to two years for all the storm damaged neighborhoods to be rebuilt. The human cost to these communities is harder to calculate.
The devastation is appalling, and 45 people lose their lives. But many more would have died had it not been for the radio and TV weather warnings from people like Gary England. Throughout the disaster, Gary's team were on air non-stop for 30 hours. Such dedication has earned Gary universal respect. In my childhood, it was watch Gary England. You know, got to turn Gary on. He's very important. If he hadn't been on there, there would have been a lot of people killed, really. He saved our lives. I don't have enough thank yous for him. And I don't know what we'd do without him in Oklahoma. The tornado also left a lasting impression on the scientists who chased it into the city on May the 3rd. I'm still not over it. It, it you know, took days to, uh, well, basically, afterwards, I had to go home and see my family. Just had to get out of town. This year has been a particularly devastating year for tornadoes, mainly because the tornadoes that have occurred have gone through some large metropolitan areas. The outbreak that occurred in Oklahoma City in early May was not the biggest outbreak of tornadoes ever, um, but it was one of the worst killers and one of the most damaging outbreaks, mainly because the tornadoes went through an urban area. If those tornadoes had gone through a relatively deserted area of West Kansas or the Texas Panhandle, they wouldn't have made big news. Interestingly, the largest tornado that happened in Oklahoma on that day has hardly gotten any attention, and it's because it went through a relatively rural area. It was a tornado that was over a kilometer and a half in diameter, probably twice as large as the one that went through Oklahoma City, with much more potential for damage. But fortunately, it went through rural areas and was relatively unnoticed. After the tornado, the skies are leaden and heavy. The storm chasers are experiencing a range of different emotions. Todd is disappointed at having missed out on seeing any of the tornadoes. When the forecast models show the area that was such a 200, 300 mile radius, and if you're not in the right area when it goes, it's hard to catch up with it. After talking to victims of the tornado, the others are more concerned about the effect it's having on them. It was a bit close last night, wasn't it? It was a bit close last night. I've got knots so big in my stomach, I, I can't even eat, really. It's terrible. You get about a tornado just come across here, I mean, they were just dropping out of the sky from every direction, so I think we were, you know, we could count ourselves lucky that we're still here. We did not see any tornadoes. Um, at first, it was a little frustrating, you know, it was because we were right on its tail end coming up, and I think it would affect me differently had I seen it tear up whole neighborhoods. Yeah, you know, I, I might just be on a plane on the way home now. Who knows? As they drive out through the suburbs of Oklahoma City, the chasers see for themselves the full scale of the devastation, especially in the suburb of Moore. Yeah, look, all the damage over here. Look at that one house. It's ripped as gone. Houses, motels, and businesses now lie in ruins along a mile-wide, 38-mile-long track. And over here, too. Look at this in that building. Look at the overpass. Look at all the debris here. For Simon Aubrey, chasing no longer has the same appeal. Somewhat lost my enthusiasm a little bit after the events of last night. I feel I'm ready to look forward to going home now, even though we've got three days left. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to going home, back to England. Seeing the aftermath of a major tornado has drained them all. On one of the last days of their tour, the storm chasers visit another town that has been damaged by a tornado. 
Simon now finds it very disturbing. I don't feel I should be here. I, I think we should just um, carry on. You know, this is, this is not what I've come to see, really. But realising that, um, you know, this, this type of disruption can be caused by this, um, you know, this storm, I feel that we should just move on. Um, I, I don't really want to be here now. But Todd Thorne, the leader of the group, feels justified in viewing and filming the wreckage. Oh, this is just part of nature and what it does. And all the other news crews are here, and chasers and whoever else is here seeing the damage. Well, we're showing this on TV and other programs. People will see the danger, what tornadoes can do, and help save other lives by seeing the damage themselves on TV. It's not really that nice to look at, but, you know, people are going to come, people are going to cover it, and, um, you know, I think it just gives you an idea, really, of what kind of damage it does, and some of these places is just totally, totally flattened. The destruction is unbelievable. I mean, it's just, it's just like, um, it's just taking the top of the uh, building away. There's, the bricks are just, there's nothing left. Lots for words. Lots for words. At the end of the tour, the group goes to visit the National Severe Storms Laboratory with its Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. Here, scientists try to give the National Weather Service and the general public as much warning of severe thunderstorms and tornadoes as possible. In the Oklahoma City tornado, warnings were issued from 10 minutes to half an hour in advance. This is a developing supercell that will produce damage in this area eventually. In the case of the Oklahoma City storm, we can see it move up the interstate highway and move into the Oklahoma City metro area proper. And the red color in this case, at the tip of this appendage or hook, is actually the debris from homes, houses, and businesses, and it's highly reflective to radar energy. So we see the debris cloud in that instance, and it actually detaches from the rest of the echo as it tracks off to the northeast. Supercell thunderstorms are very common in the plains of the United States, but they've actually been documented in, in uh, Great Britain as well. So it's not confined just to the US. Australia also has a fair number of tornadoes. The damage done in Oklahoma City was devastating and tragic for the people involved. But the scientists who were studying the tornado that day are becoming confident that soon they will be able to predict these deadly storms, increasing the likelihood of saving lives. I would guess that perhaps within five or ten years, we might be able to uh, determine more accurately whether or not a storm will produce a tornado or not, and if it does produce a tornado, whether it will be a strong tornado or a weak tornado. Even if scientists do predict tornadoes more accurately, they'll never be able to stop them. Houses and businesses like these will always be smashed to bits. So another important area of scientific study is into how to build a structure that can withstand these enormous forces of nature. Against a major tornado, the average house doesn't stand any chance at all.
there is a kind of building which can withstand even the biggest of tornadoes. Some years ago, seven people saved their lives by taking shelter in such a structure when everything around them was destroyed. It was in Wichita Falls, Texas. Tina Keel was one of those people. I came to work that afternoon and, and the day was just very muggy and sticky and everything was very humid and um, we thought, I knew something was strange about that day. And then when we started watching the clouds circle and all that and, and I was sitting there in my window looking at the houses across the street and watching the shingles lifting off the houses, I was thinking, you know, this is, this is so weird. Then the tornado sirens started just before 6 o'clock. The person on the radio said, everyone take cover in the southwest part of town. So we knew we were going to be hit. Anyone uh, in the sound of my voice, there is a tornado on the ground near the Sykes Center area in Wichita Falls. Please take cover. Please take cover. Everyone kind of just said, the money vault probably would be the strongest place because, you know, we have the big door here and, and and uh, so everyone just decided to run to that vault. And we got in there, and, but we didn't have time to get the doors shut. So the doors were open when, we, when the tornado hit. It was the loudest roaring you've ever heard. It was just deafening. And also, you could feel the pressure. You could feel it popping your ears. And, and it scooted me a couple of times off, you know, towards the door on the floor. I was sitting on the floor. You could hear the glass breaking. You could hear this deafening sound of roaring. When we came out, there was nothing left. <laughs> I mean, if we hadn't gotten in the vault, it would have been disastrous. Everything all around us was gone. You couldn't, you couldn't remember what was where because it, there was nothing any taller than your waist out there, and everything was all, all gone. It's obviously designed to keep certain people out, but just what is it about a bank vault that enables it to keep a tornado out? At the Texas Tech University in Lubbock, scientists are recreating the power of a tornado using a compressed air cannon. They're looking at the impact of debris flying at speeds of 100 miles an hour on brick walls, glass, and sheet metal. This is the kind of debris you might expect to be unleashed at high velocity in the course of a tornado. Bricks, wood, steel, copper piping. Ordinary buildings don't stand a chance. This is what you might expect in the biggest of tornadoes, with winds of over 300 miles an hour. But flying debris isn't the only kind of danger associated with tornadoes. Hailstones routinely become golf ball sized at least, easily damaging car bodywork and smashing windscreens. But some buildings do survive. Why? There's more to this wall than meets the eye. The secret is that it's not just ordinary brickwork. It's a sandwich of reinforced concrete and steel. Experts now recommend that those living in Tornado Alley build a safe haven in the middle of their house using these toughened materials. The advice was taken seriously by at least one household in Oklahoma City. Beth Bartlett and her mother Norma survived in their home because of the storm shelter they designed and built themselves. Not much else remains of their house though, as they explained to reporter Shilpa Mater. tell you what, what that was the living room in there this obviously was the kitchen there pantry um, that was more a computer room than anything else a utility room out there the computer was trashed but there's sticky notes she had sticky notes all around the monitor 
They're still, still there. They're still stuck. The and the clock on the still. wall was still there. There's a shower curtain laying over here that I've, that's not ours. We found a Precious Moments figurine in the dining room that wasn't broken, and that wasn't ours. This was my living room, my bedroom. And this is the main remodel back here with great big, gorgeous bathroom. Used to be gorgeous bathroom. Now it has a lot of skylights. The Bartlett's homemade storm shelter is quite remarkable. It is thought to be the only storm shelter above ground that has ever withstood the impact of a major tornado. I like calling it a storm closet. Storm closet. Safe room is what they're calling it, but in our case, it's a storm closet because it was my closet also. It's incredible because out there, it's like your house was made of tissue. And then you come in here and you see what yeah, solid this is 12 inch, 12 inch concrete. And it didn't budge. It didn't shake. It didn't rattle. Everyone asked us if we could feel the vibrations, and we couldn't. We couldn't feel any vibration. Mm -hmm. Lots of noise. Terrible noise. What kind of a noise was it? Well, it's like you take a jet airplane engine and a freight train and smash them all together and then add all the loud noise you can think of. And it was <gasps> like crunching that. sounds and. We Whoa. heard things hitting the house. We heard something that probably was brick and debris as it crumbled and crushed as it went over the house. My first thought was it's going to give. My, I kind of panicked. I said, Bet, it's not going to hold. It's crumbling. But it didn't. Before she opened the door, she looked under the door and saw that there was light coming under the door. And she said, Mom, the house is gone. But even then, we didn't imagine this. Not this kind of destruction. I figured the roof, roof was gone. gone, but we never dreamed that it was total destruction. And so what is this, steel? It's 12 inches of poured concrete with steel in, inside it. Steel like rods? Yeah, yeah. Both directions. Running all the way through it. Every 12 inches, there's a steel rod about the size of my finger going up and down and crossways every 12 inches. So it's inches. like a... Crisscross. Because when you think about it, that actually makes sense. That gives it a lot of strength. Yeah. Beth and Norma Bartlett are now determined to rebuild a new home around their storm shelter. But it's hard to know how you would feel when not just your house, but your whole neighborhood is blown away. One year before the Oklahoma tornado, the small town of Spencer in South Dakota went through a similar ordeal, and it's revealing to see what's happened to the people there since then. Well, it just kind of took my breath away. I was the first one to look out, and I couldn't believe, you know, in that few minutes, everything was just wiped out. And then I thought, well, there's got to be just, everybody's got to be dead, because, you know, it just looked, Levels, you know. I really thought that we were going to lose more people than we did. I'm just thankful we didn't. I don't know. I just really, you know, it just makes you sick, physically sick. There's more than one dead. There are several dead. Uh, there are. Uh, about 30 people so far, 30 to 40, that have been evacuated by ambulances to hospitals. One year on, and from the rubble, a new Spencer is emerging. But people have different reactions to disasters of this kind. One local couple, Sam and Chuck Roberts, decided they were going to stay in Spencer. Well, then after a couple of days, we really decided we were going to try to rebuild. We've got loyal customers here, and uh, they wanted us to, be, to, to build back, and they wanted Chuck for a mechanic. <laughs> so we did. It has taken them a year, but their business is slowly growing again. Kind of city stuff or not? I think they were deciding factor for a lot of people moving back here. 
And I think some of these people that were here would have probably moved out. Not everyone feels the same way. My first reaction was they should bulldoze the whole thing and get it. I mean, you just got a tiny few people living here, and, and the money they're going to spend, like, you know, on waterworks, and the, it just doesn't justify the end. We decided the night when it blew away, we wasn't coming back. And the, the tornado hit on a Saturday, and on Sunday we had an apartment in Salem already. That really wasn't hard at all. My kids tell me I'm just a tough old bird. I just keep on surviving, you know. I guess maybe that's what you need to keep it going nowadays. So we can't have another one now. No. No, no. If we do, I'll just run back in the bathroom, I suppose. It's got no windows, this one don't, so. <laughs> The same spirit will eventually prevail here in Oklahoma City. It is not the first place to be devastated by a tornado, nor will it be the last. Here, as in Spencer and many other towns before it, the community rallies round to support those made homeless by the storm. And gradually, from the ruins, families will start to rebuild their homes and their lives once again.